Hey, hey, South by Southwest, how you doing? Woo! Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Y'all, I am Kelly Robinson. I use she, her pronouns. I'm proud to serve as president of the Human Rights Campaign. And y'all, when I tell you we have a panel for you on today, get ready. Uh, we're here to talk about when beer goes viral, the role of brands and media in fighting hate. I'm excited to introduce our panelists. First up, we have a trans activist and, uh, excuse me, a trans actress and content creator who's most well known for her series Girls and Days of Girlhood. She has over one billion views across TikTok and IG. She is none other than the Dylan Mulvaney. Yes. Welcome, welcome. We are also joined today by the CEO and founder of Walton Isaacson. He is a 2023 Advertising Hall of Fame inductee. Give it up for Aaron Walton. And rounding out our panel for today, we have someone who's well known for their published work in Elle, Teen Vogue, Marie Claire, really everywhere. Uh, they run the LGBTQ plus section at NBC News Digital with a focus on the trans community. Give it up for Joe Yerkeba. <laughs> Welcome panelists. Hey. hey. So y'all, I'm excited to dig into this conversation. Of course, my day job is as president of the Human Rights Campaign, but every day I walk around this world as a black, queer woman, all right? And the thing that's happened over the last few years is it feels like we are in whiplash. You know, I remember the times where equality and progress felt inevitable. I mean, we, had the, the, um, we passed marriage equality in 2015. The White House was wrapped up in a rainbow flag. Modern family was winning every Emmy on earth. Like, we were seeing this moment that felt like the move towards equality and change was inevitable. But lately, especially in the last few years, especially for my queer and trans folks, it's felt like a regression. You know, we're back to being pushed and forced in the closet in a world that feels like we should be more out and allied than ever before. Um, you know, I know that the Human Rights Campaign, we declared a national state of emergency for the first time ever last year in response to this horrific uptick of anti-LGBTQ plus legislation. I mean, already this year, we've seen over 400 bills targeting our community. And on top of that, the violence in our community, especially against trans and non-binary folks, especially against black trans women, is at astronomical levels. So I think this panel for me is really about making sense of it all. How is it that we live in a world where there are more out people than ever before? I mean, 30% of Gen Z identify as a member of the community. And at the same time, we're seeing such a horrific backlash. There's something out of whack with where the country is and where business and policy purports us to be. So I want to dig into this because I know y'all have been at the forefront in so many ways over the last year about how this is showing up. And I think to kick us off, Dylan, I'm going to ask you, especially last year, tell us a little bit about what you experienced in this sort of backlash effect. Yeah, well, a beer boycott was definitely not on my bingo card, um, but we were rolling with it. And I think what's so crazy for me is I come from the theater world and from Broadway and content creation really was just something that I found a lot of joy in. And it wasn't my profession to begin with. It then, you know, started to lead that way. And then to see all of the hate that came from just one advertisement on Instagram was so disheartening. And then it became a very real world thing where I had people showing up to my house and being followed and harassed in public. And that was something I would have never thought was going to be a part of my daily life. And I would never wish that on anyone, especially any other trans or queer content creator. And I think what's so wild about all of this is that I came out as a girl when I was four years old to my mom. And I then, you know, lived my life uh, in the incorrect gender for quite a while. And then I, I did get to come out almost two years ago now. It's on Tuesdays, my second year of womanhood. Um, and I was really using social media as a way to find joy and find my femininity and, and share and build community. And, and what's so sad was I, as a child, I stripped parts of myself away to conform and to feel less um, othered. And, and now, this past year, it was the same situation. I was taking those parts of myself away and, and now having to build those back up. And I think um, it's, it's 
even more scary to know that a video that I make or a brand collab that I do now has major effects on the rest of the trans community because I'm one of the most privileged, if not the most privileged trans person in this country right now. And I think we need to be thinking about how these actions affect the rest of the community. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, what really stands out for me is that this is a brand that knowing how powerful your brand is, right, as an out trans person came to you asking for help and then when things get a little bit dicey, everything shifted and changed, right? Joe, can you tell us a little bit more about, as you were covering the story, how did it play out for you? What did you see? What was covered and what was missed? Sure, yeah, so um, at NBC Out, my boss says that our informal slogan is by us for everyone. So we really try to center the LGBTQ plus community and their experiences first, and then we make that accessible for everyone. And so in covering what happened to Dylan, the first thing that we really wanted to do was obviously like center the hate that she was facing. I think that a lot of people were talking about beer sales. Um, and so we really wanna focus, you know, how is this actually affecting people's lives? Um, and then we provide context for that. So we really wanted to show how this isn't an isolated incident. This happened within the context of, um, you know, state legislatures last year considered more than 500 bills targeting LGBTQ plus people. Um, and we saw Target face similar backlash for a pride campaign they did over the summer. Um, so we show people that, you know, this isn't happening in a vacuum. Um, and this has real effects on people's lives. And I think one of the other most recent examples we can see of that is in Oklahoma, um, where I just returned from covering the death of Nex Benedict, who is a 16-year-old trans student there who died a day after a fight in um, his school bathroom. And uh, his friends told me while I was there that regardless of what his cause of death was, because we don't have that information officially, they believe that you know what created a hostile school climate was the language coming from state officials. So Oklahoma has a bathroom bill that bans trans students from using the bathrooms of their gender identity. So they think that you know that's really what contributed to Nex's death in the end. And th so that's how we cover this, is we try to center the experiences of LG LGBTQ plus people first and how it affects their lives. Thank you for that. Now, Aaron, I kind of want to go to you here. Um, from your perspective, you work in the marketing world. What is happening? How much is the political landscape impacting business decisions around marketing? What are they getting right and what are they getting wrong? Well, the fact is that it is having an impact. Um, some good and some bad and I'm not gonna be Pollyanna about it because there's a lot of bad that's happening. Um, and if you looked at it through the lens of the glass is half empty versus half full, I I'm more of an optimist and I'm gonna say that the things that I see are very optimistic in terms of where the world is. GLAAD just did a survey of non-LGBTQ plus adults and the great news is that 70% of that community, non-LGBTQ plus adults, said that it was important for the brands that they are supporting to identify and be public about their support for the policies that support our community. Huge news. Can you say that number again? 70% mm. of the non-LGBTQ plus consumers, adults, Here's the other good in information. If you look at another study that was done by Fast Company and the Harris Poll, 89% of people in our community, in the LGBTQ plus community, say that they're paying attention to brands and the policies that they have to support us. 65% of those people in the community say that they are willing to boycott or have boycotted a brand. So from those brands that are supporting and have made the decision to be on the right side of history by not backing down to the political landscape that's happening, the data supports their decision. The data supports that they're doing the right thing. Here's the other part that's really amazing. If you actually think from a, well, let's separate the moral obligation that brands have, that we have as humans to do the right thing. If you just look at the business realities of what is supposed to be done, the LGBTQ plus community has $3.9 trillion in buying power. 
Mm. Let me say that again. $3.9 trillion in buying power. Any brand that wants to be a brand of the future, yeah, you can look back at the past, but you have to be thinking about the future, and you're not going to have a successful future if you're ignoring that consumer. It's not going to happen. So as a brand steward, as someone that is obligated to help brands grow, sell more products, sell more services, you have to address the realities of what the data is showing you. Good partners aren't there just during the good, good times. Good partners are there when a community like ours is under attack. That's the definition of a good partner. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that we're going to remember. Those are the people that are going to survive and wake up on the right side of history because they did the right thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm really optimistic about some of the brands that are actually doing the right thing, despite the political wins, despite what they're hearing. And we have to remember that it's a small group of people with a loud megaphone. Mm -hmm. So when you get depressed about it and start thinking like, oh my God, what's going on? And there's no question, there's legislation that we all have to get out there and fight for. And corporate America has been a big part of you know, trying to make that change. But there are some really good signs out there that could be really positive for us. And so the brands that want to win are paying attention. Mm. There's somebody in this room that needed to hear that. You have an amen corner about right over here that was <laughs> rooting for you, okay? Um, but I think that that's so important to know that it's not only about being on the right side of history, it's also about doing what is best for the future of business, for the future of your employee base, right? You, I mean, you're another... absolutely right. Yeah. Sorry, because what, you mentioned it. You know, all of these brands are really excited about Gen Z. Well, folks, 30% of Gen Z identify as being part of the LGBTQ plus community. You're not going to get them by ignoring them. It's not going to happen. If you want their love, if you want their loyalty, and you should, then you better do the right thing mm -hmm. and pay attention to who they are and meet them where they are. Don't expect them to come to you. Yes. Well, um, Reverend Dr. Aaron Walton, let me ask you another question while we're at it. What does the roadmap look like? Like, what are some examples of companies that have done this and gotten it right and reaped some of the benefits? Listen, uh, there are a lot of companies. If, in fact, you're going to be a partner, it is a ongoing journey to be a partner with, in the LGBTQ plus community. And that doesn't mean just stepping up during June and Pride months. I tell folks I am black and gay 365 days a year. I am not just black in February during Black History Month, nor am I just gay in June during Pride Month. So if you want my loyalty, if you want my relationship as an advocate for your brand, you have to be talking to me 365 days a year. We have an opportunity, brands have an opportunity, part of what we have to do is close the ally gap. You know, some brands have done a great job of that. That's the, the gap that exists between a brand or a company's intent to do the right thing and their ability to actually do the right thing when the heat is on. Mm -hmm. Levi's is doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. They've done an excellent job. North Face has done a right, the right thing because they haven't been to the political hate. They haven't been to the political mm -hmm. winds that we know are gonna blow away, but are having an impact right now. So there, there are things that they can do, and they have to start thinking about it, not just in terms of the consumer-facing opportunities, but also about the B2B, the internal impact, right? We want people to wanna to stay in our companies. We want them to support us as employees. Well, part of that means that we don't veer away from those values that we talk about so frequently. Those values that we put in our advertising, those values that we put in, in the policies that we share with, with the people in our organizations, they shouldn't change. Mm -hmm. Values are values. That's who we are, that's what we, sh we should stand for. If we want to keep the retention rate, which by the way, costs money when people leave, 
they're leaving because they don't feel valued and ex ex appreciated, then we are gonna we are gonna lose. So I do think that there is opportunities for these brands to continue to lean into the corporate values that they espouse, and they'll win. Yeah, and I think a really important point that you make is that sometimes the media coverage is of the things that go wrong in these campaigns, but there are far more examples of when businesses are standing up and standing with the LGBTQ plus community that they actually reap the benefits. I mean, the same attacks that were launched against this beer provider, right, were also things that were shot at Nike. But when Nike refused to cede ground and stood up against the bullies, the attacks dissipated. The same thing happened with North Face. And Levi's is a great example, Right, where they've been doing year-round inclusive LGBTQ plus work. In fact, just last year, they introduced a new gender-neutral line of apparel, right? Um, and they're reaping jeans, yeah. the benefits of it. So I guess my question is, you know, it's March already. We know a lot of businesses and companies are thinking about Pride Month. Maybe they already got their Pride Month plans in place. Dylan, I want to ask you, as folks are thinking about coming back into the community and in doing what they can to support all of the progress and momentum that we need to get back on our side, how can they be thinking about engaging with content creators in a better way than what we saw last year? Oh, totally. I think communication is so key. And with what happened to me last year, unfortunately, you know, certain brands kind of didn't even continue speaking with me. And I think I could have been so integral to um, the solutions, but they continued because I, I think of it kind of like as like a parent where if a parent doesn't put a stop to something, then the bullying can continue. And I think that's sometimes these brands need to step up and kind of put these people just to let them know this isn't okay. And then it is everything's okay. And I think more than ever for any queer or trans talent, they, we need to be communicating with actual humans behind these campaigns. A lot of the times when a brand puts together a campaign, there's no trans or queer person even on that team shaping this content or this brief. And so much of what I want to do going forward is really creating relationships and having conversations, which I know in the brand space can be difficult because things move so fast. But I think that extra step of really getting to know a talent and what they want to put out into the world and what their you know, hopes are for this, this campaign can make everything a lot smoother. And if things do go wrong, that communication is already in place. So there's that level of trust that needs to happen. And I never thought that writing into a legal contract, it would need to say, like, in the case of a boycott, mm. this, this, and this will happen. But that's where we're, we're at right now. Dylan said something that's really important. I hope people really take this in. You know, companies have to stop rewarding the wrong behavior. Mm. What, en what ends up happening mm. when you give in to that fear... And when you start to prioritize the negative hate mm -hmm. versus the love and the community, you ultimately will lose. It's not just the community you lose, you'll also lose the allies. Mm -hmm. You know, my mom, my cousins, my uncles, my sisters are all watching how we're treated. Well, and I did have an idea how to fix last year's situation. I thought, I, th I come from a comedy background, I did stand up, I think humor can be very healing and I think it can appeal to both sides. Mm -hmm. And I thought how fun if we had done like some sort of Western commercial where it was like a cowboy at the end of the bar and then maybe a trans person on the other and there's like one beer in the center and it's like <laughs> just because we could have a laugh and to show that like as much as you know, the, these are all very real world things. There's also some sort of compassion in the fact that we all like beer or we all like this skincare brand or this makeup company and it doesn't have to be separate. And, and unfortunately, they didn't reach out so we couldn't talk about some of those things. But um, I do really hope to find the goodness going forward in this. And I think Pride last year was so bleak because I, I talked to a lot of other trans and queer content creators who had their jobs pulled from them. It was sort of this, this trickle-down effect. And so much of what we'd heard in the past years was exactly what Aaron was saying, like, we want to see it 365 days a year. 
but they even took away Pride Month mm. from a lot of us creators. And that was when we were actually making money and a lot of people were paying their bills for many months afterwards and then they didn't have that. So at least give us that you know, at the very minimum. And, and I also think let us as the community appoint you an ally and not just a company calling yourself an ally. I think that's something to be earned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also this goes beyond just you know this relationship between the creator and the brand but i'm now interested to know what kind of benefits you have for your trans employees mm -hmm. you know is there gender affirming care being offered there's so many other employees to think about and and when i go to partner with the brand i want to think of myself as an employee and i want to be seen the same way this needs to be a a bigger relationship yeah. And there's so much there, right? Like, I feel like there's this narrative out there that, you know, companies are wholeheartedly rolling back all of their efforts here. And really, the story is a lot more complicated than that. Uh, I mean, we at the Human Rights Campaign, we do a program called the Corporate Equality Index, and it is the benchmarking tool in the nation for measuring internal policies related to the LGBTQ community and LGBT inclusion. And we actually saw record levels of participation in that tool, more than we have in the last 20 years that we've done it. And at the same time, you are seeing a pulling back in the public space of advocating for our issue. And I just have to say, like, as somebody, I, I was in Oklahoma, too, supporting the folks down there around the death of Next Benedict. And I think one thing that's very clear is that as we're in a moment where you have horrific anti trans and anti-LGBTQ plus legislation across the country, there are kids out there looking to adults to see what we are going to do and not being visible not being out loud about our allyship is simply not an option. So we've got to make sure that these companies are doing the right thing internally, but also standing up boldly and publicly about these things that matter. Yes, because it's right, the right thing to do, but also because when you listen to the numbers that Aaron said, it is the business-minded business case for why you take these actions. So Joe, I want to talk to you a little bit about the coverage around this. What tips do you have for reporters that are covering kind of this really complex and dynamic landscape around LGBTQ plus issues? Yeah, so the first one is to always talk to the people you're talking about. So if you're doing a story about trans people, please talk to trans people. Um, the second one is, uh, for, is kind of a framing issue. And I think um, I always recommend against using the term culture war um, without saying exactly what you're talking about. So I think a lot of, we saw a lot of the coverage of what happened to Dylan, just frame it as, you know, part of the culture war battle, when really what it was, was the result of an increasingly hostile climate due to a wave of bills targeting the trans community, which is a lot more words, I, I understand, but I think it's so much more specific, um, and it gives readers so much more information. Um, the second thing, uh, in terms of framing, is I feel like we see a lot of coverage of trans people that treat us as new um, or a new trend or as you know some kind of agenda and um, when you know that just history tells us that's not true trans people you know can be go back to the dawn of time um, and so I think that if you're covering these issues at all you need to be really familiar with the history in order to not repeat those mistakes and one thing I, I always like to tell people to do is um, to Google the 1995 Newsweek cover um, on bisexuality uh, and the title was bisexual not gay not straight a new identity emerges and it was these people who look very menacing on the cover and um, I think it's just an example of kind of how the LGBTQ plus community has been covered throughout history as like something new and sensational um, when in reality that's just not what's happening we've always been here it's just that now we're becoming more more visible mm. and I kind of want to go to you Dylan to talk more about your project days and girlhood and I can't really call it project you told me about how you kind of stumbled into it. a happy accident um, I truly thought coming out videos could be a little cringe and I was like oh how do I, you know, come out to people and make it, you know, kind of funny and lighthearted? And so I, it was essentially like a comedy video. It's like day one of being a girl. And it then became something much more vulnerable and, and bigger. And I never thought that I would be sharing such vulnerable parts of myself. Um, but I think back to like my younger self who, you know, lived in a household where gay marriage wasn't really seen as something that um, was you know, it was very taboo in my household. And now in this country, thinking about 
us not having it feels absolutely insane to me. And now with transness, I'm hoping that it's the same trajectory of like, you know, the people that are being so outwardly transphobic online in my comments and my DMs, I'm hoping that that will become like increasingly embarrassing for them and that these media organizations and these social platforms will be equally embarrassed that they tolerated and allowed these things to happen and didn't step up when we needed them most. Um, but I also think about how specific to TikTok, because I still am like, what is this app? What am I even doing? <laughs> I think it's, it's a way for young people, especially to see people that are like them. And I, I remember, um, kind of one of the only characters on television was uh, Kurt on Glee was like the only feminine type of person that I, I even could connect to. And that wasn't even a trans character growing up. And so I, a lot of the times will like watch a video and be like, I wonder what my younger self would think about this. Um, and that's why it is so powerful and why we need to be seeing as much as it's important to see it online. I think in advertisement, it becomes even more real. And in scripted, it's easier because it doesn't feel so um, in your face that you can almost take it in with a little bit more distance because it's a character. Um, and that's why it needs to be a full sort of 360 approach to having trans and queer people in the media. I love that. I feel like so much of what we're experiencing now is a challenge of visibility, right, in so many ways. And Joe, I love what you were saying because I think what it does is it puts us, what was it, 1996 cover? Uh, 1995, yeah. 1995, oh, before Y2K, so things were easy then. <laughs> uh, but it puts us in the context of how history has evolved over time. Because I'm reminded that to your point, Dylan, 25 years ago, they were actually debating the Defense of Marriage Act in the halls of Congress, right? Trying to officially ban the right to same-sex marriage. And now the Respect for Marriage Act is the law of the land. But what we know changed definitively in that time period was the visibility. Back 25 years ago, only 30% of Americans believed that they knew someone who was lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And that number got to around 70% where it stands today and laws and policy changed in suit. Right now with the trans community, we are really in a place where about 30% of the country believes they know someone who's trans or non-binary. That presents a huge gap in understanding that I think that there are some extremists that are coming in with fear in a place where we should have curiosity and kindness and empathy. So I'm curious to anyone on the panel, what can we learn about where we've been that might help us to indicate where we need to go, both in business, at communications and media and society and to getting towards this sort of watershed moments of change? You know, it's really, it's funny because there's so many things floating through my head when you were talking about that. I remember having a conversation with a client one time and they were talking about how it was critical for them to get millennials and how important that was. And we were talking about doing some segmented work against millennials and we were talking about doing LGBT work, we were talking about doing black and Hispanic work, and the client said, oh, no, 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 no. You know, millennials are colorblind. And I paused and I said, uh, hmm. So, first of all, when is being blind a good thing? <laughs> Actually, millennials aren't colorblind, they're color confident, mm. they're color courageous, they see color, they understand it, they celebrate it in a way that is important for them. So if you want them, you have to lean into it. Old ways of thinking was that, uh, no, no, we're just going to treat everyone the same. We should be celebrating the trans community. We should be celebrating the Hispanic. Like, all of those communities have rich histories and contributions to not just culture, but to business. There's, there's a, um, a German philosopher from the early 19th century. His name was Hegel. And he came up with something called the dialectic method as a way to explain how innovation and change happens. And his philosophy was basically every idea has an equal and opposite idea. And when the two ideas collide, they create a new one that consists of the best of the two. Mm. I look at DE and IB, I look at how we are working together in different consumer segments, as an opportunity to bring these cultural experts together to create something even bigger. There are things that I will learn from Dylan and her experience as a white trans woman that I would never experience as a black gay man. And I'm not gonna experience it the same, but my God, I'm learning something new. And that's where innovation happens, right? That's when the big ideas come out. 
I've never had a client say I don't want more innovation. Mm. I've only had them say I want more, I want less innovation. They've only said they wanted more. Mm. So that's kind of where things are moving, I think. And that's where the smart people are, are tapping into. Mm. Anything to add? Um, I mean, in terms of looking at where we've been, um, I always think about coverage of the AIDS epidemic um, and sort of how horrific it was and stigmatizing it was of the community um, and really uh, how it repeated a lot of misinformation at the time. Um, and so I think that I, I tell journalists, and I try to do this myself, is to not repeat misinformation without saying what the facts really are. So, for example, you know, when I'm covering um, gender-affirming care and efforts to restrict gender-affirming care across the country for minors, uh, if a sponsor of one of those bills says, uh, I want to do this because I want to prevent children from getting surgeries, I don't just quote him and not say, you know, the truth, which is that um, in most states where these bills are being considered, surgeries are hard to get even for adults let alone for minors, and they're not provided to minors in any form in that state. Um, and so I think that that's something that I really would like to see more in journalism is that we don't just state, restate what people are saying when we know that it's not true, and we do our job and fact check that information and give people what the truth really is. Mm. Dylan, can you tell me a little bit, so I mean, I think part of what this equation looks like to get to the other side of the attacks that we're seeing, as Aaron said, like, this isn't about where the majority of the country is, where the majority of people are. This is some extremism that has bubbled up in response to so much of the progress that we've made. But part of the way I think that we bridge this gap is to create spaces where people like you and people that are watching you and people that are watching them watch you um, feel more comfortable being out and being fully who they are. What can you say to those people who are really wrestling with, right, the climate that we're in, but also the need to create an environment that's safer for others that are looking to them as role models? Absolutely. Well, I think about my own personal sort of like uh, chosen family that I built. And a lot of those people were the ones that immediately when I came out, there was no hesitation. It was, I see you as a woman. I honor that in you. Let me help you out. Let me teach you something. And I think it's it's finding those people and and then especially if you haven't come out yet I think it's it's making sure that you are you feel 100% ready 100% safe there are even things that I've shared online that I've looked back on and said oh maybe wasn't so ready to talk about that and I think it's also finding you know people to follow finding um, you know television programs to watch, like I talked about Glee. So much of what I grew up watching was like trans people facing violence on mm. law and order or as sex workers. And now I wanna see trans joy. Yes. You know, I wanna see a rom-com starring a trans person. And, and yet we need that trans joy in marketing as well. And I would say my identity is maybe like 5% of who I am as a person. And so there are so many other pieces of, of a creator or a talent to capitalize on. Mm. And I think that that joy, that trans joy is inadvertent, whether we're speaking on it or not. And I think there's actually something really beautiful about working with someone diverse and just letting them do their thing and not having to capitalize yes. on that. I remember um, last year I was doing like a food delivery ad and I sent in a really funny script and they were like, could you talk a little bit about how hard your childhood was? And I was like, oh, shit, okay, well, you know, I guess, you know, I, I should be so lucky that I have this gig, but no, they should be so lucky. Mm. And I want every um, trans and queer creator to feel the same way that they can, you know, show the other parts of themselves. And a lot of that has to do with hiring people behind the scenes that can, can come in and create ideas and, and help lead campaigns, but then also talking to the creator, like I talked about before. Yes, I love that. It's a joy for me. And was that like a Beyonce style soft drop? Is there a rom com coming out soon? Okay, we're working on some things. Oh, yeah, there's, okay. There's, but, but I will also say that, like, right now, um, it's it's extremely difficult to to get queer and trans people platformed. And mm -hmm. so, if anyone in this room is in a place to make those things happen, please do or speak up for us in rooms that we don't exist in. Because I hear a lot mm -hmm. from, now I'm starting to do these sort of um, corporate talks or, or going in and meeting with a company where, you know, the young corporate girlies like have our backs, but then as it, you know, goes up the chain of command, things get lost and people get scared. And, and so, when you are somewhere to, to say something, please do. Mm. 
So we're going to have plenty of time for audience questions in just a second, but I just want to give you all a chance. Like, what's giving you, in the midst of everything that we're seeing out there, in the midst of everything that we're fighting against, what's giving you hope and what's possible in the future? Uh oh, there's a little, <laughs> little delay on that uh, one. <laughs> I'll tell you what's giving me hope. Um, you know, I mentioned it earlier, the data is giving me hope. Yeah. The, the fact that the reality of what people really feel, not necessarily what we hear all the time, but what they feel is on our side. And ultimately, it's our job as members of the community. By the way, it's everyone's job, not just members of the community. It's the allies. Um, as well to make sure that we are echoing that as loud and as often and as visible as we can. It is our respective jobs and what's giving me hope are seeing some companies like Levi's, like North Face, that have stayed the course, mm. that are not being swayed by the negative hate, homophobia that's out there. And I think we're going to get through this, but we're only going to get through it if we pull together. We're only going to get through it if we're aligned. By the way, just sort of, you know, being completely honest, I'm on the HRC board, so I'm very happy <laughs> to be, we're very to happy be here. <laughs> so, but there are organizations like HRC that are out there doing the fight, that are trying to make sure that people understand what is at risk and what is an opportunity. And so... I'm leaning into organizations like that and spending time and money and effort uh, and energy to make sure that we're doing HRC is one of many organizations out there. But um, I'm hopeful with that sort of stuff. It can be very depressing just spending, spending all your time thinking about what isn't happening. I got to think about what we can make happen mm. and, and, and kind of pivot to that. Uh, well, a few things give me hope. One is that, um, you know, I get to have this job and that NBC Out exists and that more trans journalists are being hired to cover these stories. Um, I think that's so important. Please hire trans journalists. Um, and then the second thing is just how far we've come. I always go back to this um, story I did. I interviewed this couple who collectively spent more than 100 years in the closet. Um, and they told me, one of them, you know, his job in the Navy was to discharge soldiers who um, were gay, and they told me about the first time they ever went to a pride parade together and held hands publicly, and sort of how um, they see young queer people take that for granted, um, and I think about that all the time, and it really gives me hope for, you know, where, where we could go in the future. I think the... Gen Z, I'm on the cusp, you know, so I, I sometimes feel like my millennial humor is a little cringe, but <laughs> my, you know, slightly younger counterparts are so epic and driven and, you know, I see these comments or, you know, they say mother and at first I was like, oh my God, I'm not that old. <laughs> but then I found it was a term of endearment and, <laughs> and or I, like actually meeting humans in real life. Like I was at a Broadway musical and I met a young trans girl and her mom, I think she was 19 years old, and they both came up to me and said that they bicker a lot, but they would send each other my videos back and forth. Mm. And she, you know, talked about how she was getting her gender affirming surgery and her mom was so excited for her. And I just, that gave me hope. And also I think, you know, getting back to the only 30% of, you know, people might know a, a trans or non-binary person, or at least they think that's the mm. case. I love getting to meet real life mm. humans or getting to even see you all today because I don't want to be the enemy. I don't want to be the villain. I, I'm really just a human being that um, wants things to be okay. Mm. And, and I was sitting next to a, an older man at a uh, sort of like a gala a few weeks ago, a dinner. And I could tell he was a little conservative. And he initially, when I sat down, he goes, oh, it's the trans beer girl. And I was like, oh, God, what's about to happen? And, and then we started talking. And, and he reminded me, actually, a lot of my own dad. And I made him laugh. And I could tell that that kind of eased him up. And then by the end, he was like, can I get your email? I'd like to, you know, if I have any questions, I'd like to ask you about some stuff. And I was like, sure. 
And I thought, wow, I you know thought I was appealing to this Gen Z generation, but maybe it's the older you know white men that I need to really go and talk to and sit down and have a conversation or a beer with. Yeah. Seriously, I'm down. I'm game. But that's yes. It's. It's that one-on-one -on -one connection, and I think when we're taking in content online and seeing someone as a character and not as a real human, that's when things go wrong. And so, just always coming back to the fact that, like, oh, this is a human, and um, and trying to find someone to have that that one-on-one -on -one relationship with. Oh, I love it, Dylan. You said earlier, find the goodness, and that just resonates in everything that you said. And one of the things that gives me hope is that we are sitting here in Austin, Texas, blocks from the state capitol, talking about how we are going to create a world that's more just and more fair and more free for lesbian, gay, bi, queer, and trans people in this country. That gives me incredible hope. So y'all, we're going to take it to the questions. I don't know. I saw Steve Harvey do this on Family Feud, but I thought they would do it. <laughs> kind of pop up, but they'll come. Oh, there they are. Okay. Now, my eyes is not that good, so I got to get a little bit closer here. Um, let's just take the first question at the top. I'm a social media manager. I previously worked for a brand that was targeted for supporting pride. In your opinion, what is the best way to navigate backlash? Aaron, do you want to kick us off? Sure. You know, it's really interesting because companies, if, let's take sexual orientation out of the conversation for a second. If we had an influencer who was black, and I've said this to clients, if we had an influencer that was black, that was Hispanic, that had disability, that was maybe a woman, some group that was not particularly straight and white, and we used that influencer and people started to attack that influencer because they were black, because they were Hispanic, because they had a disability, what would you do as a company? my gut feeling is you would not back away. In fact, you would stand up and support your decision to have that influencer. So sexual orientation should not play a role in that. It does, but it should not. And so when I try to humanize it with clients, and again, to the person who asked that question, I go in and I bring the data. These corporations understand data, they follow data, it is something that is critical for their decision making, so I put it in front of them very clearly and make the business case on why they need to stay the course. And most people, reasonable people, smart people, have, have made that decision. The reality, folks, is that for a lot of CMOs, the challenge is that their lifespan as a CMO is two and a half to three years. Mm -hmm. So they're very nervous about making a decision that may be um, considered controversial. But when you provide them with the data and provide them with the information that allows them to see clearly why staying the course is the right thing, most of the smart CMOs will, will stay the course. And I want to add, that was so brilliantly said, but um, play the long game mm. because there are, are so, you know, these things are happening quick and, and these boycotts can last a day, a week. And, but if you really look at the bigger picture and how, like we said, Gen Z is so inherently queer and accepting and, and moving in that direction, that's who eventually your consumer is going to be. Mm. And they will always remember what was said or what wasn't said when these things go down. Mm. And uh, I think that's something to think about. You know, that's kind of related to another question on here for you, Dylan, this idea that these consumers will always remember what happened. Is there anything else that it really means when businesses and brands don't stand up for who they partner with, the things that your followers have taken away from the actions of that beer brand? Absolutely. I think um, when a brand hires diverse talent, but specifically content creators, we don't have some of the same resources that you know big talent might have or safety measures in place. Mm. And so when something like what happened last year to me happened, I didn't know about cybersecurity. I didn't have protections. I didn't have somewhere to go. And so when you are taking, there is a responsibility that needs to be taken by the brand, um, even before an advertisement goes out, that there will be protection and that there will be support because otherwise um, it's putting a lot of potentially mar marginalized groups and creators in a really sticky situation. Mm. 
Joe, the next question is for you. How are you able to effectively cover when brands receive backlash on LGBTQ plus initiatives without amplifying the hateful messages and misinformation as a part of those attacks? Um, well, we call it exactly what it is, hateful messages and misinformation. Um, so I think that uh, that's another place where I think that people brush over with the term culture war um, is rather than calling something out for what it is, um, they try to just use this broad term. So whenever I report on, on these issues, I always say, you know, exactly what's being said and then pointing out when it's misinformation. And to use the example of gender affirming care again, um, the sponsors of that legislation often call it chemical castration. And I've seen, you know, too many media outlets just repeat that um, language and not say that that's inflammatory inflammatory and misleading language um, that doesn't accurately describe gender affirming care. Um, when if you're quoting someone saying that, you know, you need to, you need to do said Senator so-and-so using inflammatory and inaccurate language to describe gender affirming care. Um, and so I think that people just need to be, you know, really explicit and spell it out for the reader. You know, what is this person saying? Why are they framing it that way? And is that accurate? Um, rather than just stating it without um, giving people the facts. You all have kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but what long-term strategies can companies and media outlets implement to create a more inclusive environment that celebrates diversity and, Im and minimizes the impact of some of these hate-filled campaigns? Well, the first thing that they have to do is start hiring people who are part of the community. Mm. And by the way, that's not just at the, you know, at the corporate level. We need to see them on boards, right? We need to see members of our community sitting on corporate boards where some of the policies are made. We need to see them in the C-suite. We need to see them throughout an organization uh, because that's where some of the decisions are, are made. We need to start seeing these corporations starting to spend resources, dedicating resources to better understand the community to get the real information about it. Look, there's no shortage of information that, that's out there. McKinsey did a study that talked about companies that were more gender diverse were 13% more likely to outperform their competitors. Companies that were more ethnically diverse were 34% more likely to outperform their competitors. Mm. So that type of diversity, that type of understanding that it can move a company forward. We're all competitive, we wanna win. Making sure that we have those strategies from the, from the that, that type of uh, thinking from the beginning and not an add-on is really gonna be the thing that makes a difference. And we have to start to look at subject matter, matter experts in media companies that are dedicated to serving the community. They have the information, they have the knowledge. It's not something that we should be overlooking or assume that, you know, that we certainly want to see our images, our stories, our identities played out in the general media, but we also want to see them played out in, you know, specific media that talks to us, right? Whether that's Out Magazine or, or, or you know, ABC, we want to see it across the board. So I think it really starts with making sure we have the right representation. We have people who understand the community helping to make the decisions and allocate the dollars that are required to, to develop that relationship. Yeah. Joe, do you want to get on this? I, I mean, I'm aware that earlier in this conversation you said, I'm even proud that NBC Out exists, right, as a place to have these conversations. Any other thoughts from you on kind of longer term strategies in media? Yeah, I think um, newsrooms could be doing a lot more to educate their non-LGBTQ plus reporters on covering these issues, um, because don't get me wrong, I'm really glad that I get to do it every day, but it's exhausting. Um, and it's really wonderful when I can turn to a colleague, for example, from our um, internet disinformation team and partner with them on what's happening uh, lately on X. Um, so I would say that, and then also um, to provide when you, you know, when you have reporters covering this, the LGBTQ plus community 
community who are queer and trans to provide them with support. Um, so if you're gonna send someone to Oklahoma to cover something like the death of Next Benedict, to give them the time off and support that they need because mm. covering this, you know, though I love to do it, a lot of other people do as well, um, it really takes an emotional toll. Mm -hmm. We're experiencing vicarious trauma and I feel like a lot of newsrooms are like, oh, well, I'm hiring queer people, I did it. Um, when really those people aren't getting time off to you know, recover from what they're covering. Mm. Dylan, I have a lot of questions for you on the screen. The people want to hear from you. Um, a couple mm -hmm. of things. Okay. <laughs> a couple of things here. Um, one question is about when, and I think this is kind of more broad than even only the beer company that, that we had talked about earlier, but when a brand reaches out, how do you make the decision about whether or not you want to work with that brand and understanding their brand values? Okay, well, here's the thing. So I was, I've always been a beer drinker and I actually like would show just like organically on my Instagram stories. I'd tag, like if I was having a beer, I would tag a beer company because I wanted to work with a beer company. And then um, funny enough, I had multiple offers from different mm. organizations and alcohol companies. And I think that having a team also for any talent out there that's queer or trans, making sure that your team is also knowledgeable about what a company's values are because if things are coming in so fast and you're having to make decisions and and having someone to kind of do that research um, and that's why I would love to see more trans and queer people on the agency side and on management and in you know Hollywood but I think now I really was able to take a step back in these next partnerships I want to know who I'm actually working with. I want to know the people behind that company and, and so that there is that relationship. I want to know how their queer employees are being treated and what benefits they have in place, where their dollars are going. I want to know um, just that they have my back because I think it's so easy to, to jump into bed with someone and, and now I'm, I'm learning that there's a lot of questions to ask first. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to sound self-serving, but the, the reality is that's one of the things that the Equality Index mm. does really well, right? We're out there looking at the policies and the advertising and the marketing that these brands are doing. And so I, I used to, before it was online, when HRC first came out, they had a little book with the that ranked them. And I used to carry that book all the time. I would know which gas stations I could use, I would know which, you know, brands I, I was supposed to, so th that's one of the things that I think is really valuable about what we do and could be helpful to, you know, yes. folks like you. Thank you. Um, we did the HRC uh, Trans Content Creator Summit in August, and what was so fascinating was most of us didn't know about the index mm -hmm. and, and how we could actually use it and see and track these companies that we're working with and how our teams can use the, that number as well. And honestly, HRC was one of the first uh, organizations to reach out to me when this all went down and really helped me navigate. So I wanna say thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and being able to use that index and I think on the brand side, seeing what other people's numbers are and where you all fit into this too. I love it, and thank you both. Uh, there are so many tools out there that are available to folks. I think, you know, if you go to hrc.org, I know it's not Hard Rock Cafe, it's Human Rights Campaign, hrc.org, <laughs> you can find out more about the Equality Index. And we also have, we partnered with Dylan to create an influencer's guide for folks who are, especially as we're getting into pride season, we're getting into event season, if you're looking for tools on, for influencers on how to kind of lift up these issues, there's a QR code over there that we definitely hope folks check out. But there is just such a bevy of resources for folks now that people not, might not be aware of to help them to navigate so much of what's ahead and what we're experiencing today. So I think we have time for one more question from the audience. I'm gonna go to the last one on the screen here. Beyond statements of support, how can companies translate allyship to the LGBTQ plus community into concrete actions that actually make a difference? Well, one thing is to make sure that they are not donating to organizations, politicians, who are not supporting the community. So it's very easy to find out, to hold these companies accountable. You can find out where they're donating their money. Uh, and that is one way to, to, you know, make sure that they are living up to the values that they, they say they're supposed to be living up to. 
um, and consumers have way more power than they've ever had in terms of being able to do the research, being able to be their own detectives and understanding what companies say they're doing versus what they're not doing, how they're treating employees, how they're not, you know, doing the things that that are um, there to actually help the community advance itself. So there are any number of ways to do it, but I think the, the most important thing is just making sure that they're not donating and doing things that are against our own best mm -hmm. interest. Absolutely. We talk a lot about companies putting their money where their mouths are. We have to do the same. Um, so last question to all of you. If there's one thing that folks take away from this panel today, what do you want it to be? Maybe we'll start at Joe and work our way back. Uh, if you're reporting about LGBTQ people, talk to LGBTQ people. <laughs> mm. Mm. I would say we're stronger than we're uh, perceived. Understand that the, the numbers and the support is there. We just have to be much more vocal about it. Mm. We aren't the villains, and we like beer. Uh. And, and to the brands, think about July. I always think about like what, what happens mm. the month after Pride. And, and I think that's where allyship can really extend, is, is what does it mean to take that talent that you are capitalizing on and then showcase them in a different kind of way and make sure that relationship extends um, just past something that is so visually um, allied and, and more so just integrated into your year. I love it, I love it. Y'all, I don't know if you're like me, but I've been writing it down so many, um, Oprah gave me this word quotables or tweetables on my little thing. I heard y'all say, uh, you're not gonna have a successful future without embracing this community and doing it today. I heard y'all saying, stop prioritizing and rewarding the wrong behavior from some of our companies and businesses. I heard y'all say that you've never had a client want less innovation, so why not embrace the diversity of our skill sets, our experiences? I heard you say, um, we have to be speaking for, uh, for all of our communities, even in the rooms where some of us do not yet exists. I hold you all underscore that allyship is earned. It's not something that you're given. And I think more than anything from this panel, I'm really taking away, Dylan, what you said, that we have an opportunity in this moment to find the goodness. There's a lot of dark and there's a lot of hate out there, but hate never conquers hate, right? Love always wins. And in this moment, especially in rooms like these, we have the opportunity to do something that can change the world for generations, right? What do they say? The arc of history always bends towards justice, but it doesn't happen by accident. It happens because we get together in rooms like this and we pull it and we pr pressure it and we push it to do so. And I think right now we're standing in such a critical moment where the actions that we take today are going to have impact far from now. You know, coming up as an organizer, I spent a lot of time with my, my indigenous colleagues and they would say, they would talk a lot about the seven generation ideology, right? That everything we're experiencing today is a result of actions taken three generations ago. And everything that we do today will have an impact three generations from now. We are at the precipice of change in so many ways. I'm so honored to be on a panel with you all where we talk about just that. So can y'all give it up for our amazing panel today? Yes, give it up for all of them. And before you leave, I have two very important announcements. Anyone that wants to get a beer with Dylan and the rest of us, we're having a happy hour outside of room 15. So come on and join us there as we continue the conversation. And this is very special. This is very important. For the first time ever, this is a world premiere of a new song that's coming out from Dylan in two short days called Days of Girlhood, y'all. Yes. The song of the summer has arrived early. So in just a second, we are going to play this song. And Dylan said that she would be embarrassed if we all danced our asses off to it. So can you do me a favor and help to show this woman some embarrassment? <laughs> OK. Hold on. In just a second, we're going to play that song. We wanted to end this session with some joy. So again, thanks to the panelists. But most of all, thank you all for joining us today and continuing the work. <laughs>